Hello, I double H's. Welcome back to this definitely not a third part on the Station Strangler. I'm calling it to be or not to be in the Station Strangler. And yes, I know that is a truly awful joke, but I'm not even sorry. In this definitely not a third part episode, I want to pull a few loose threads that I simply couldn't get to when I was putting together the larger narrative. So I'm going to skip all the usual housekeeping and background, assume that you have listened to the previous two episodes, and jump right into it with the obvious question, who was Norman Simons? Norman was born in Cape Town in 1967 to Evelyn Simons and Stanley Numbewu. He lived in both Johannesburg and the Eastern Cape, before moving back to Cape Town as a teen. He got a teaching qualification in 1992, but he also had various other jobs as a packer at a grocery store and an intern at a children's home. At the time of his arrest, he was a standard three or grade five, as it would be called today, teacher at Alpine Primary School in Mitchell's Plain. According to the dissertation by profiler Mickey Pistorius, he struggled with his identity as a child of a Xhosa man and coloured woman, feeling called to and estranged from both. He was gay and many close friends and acquaintances knew this about him, but he wasn't out and he did have several girlfriends and even a girlfriend at the time of his arrest. Mickey thinks that this was one of the ways in which he felt isolated and conflicted in terms of developing his identity. We also know he struggled with depressive disorder and was first voluntarily hospitalized for treatment for this in 1991 after his older brother was stabbed to death. He would later tell people in the psychiatric clinics where he went for treatment and after his arrest that he had been raped by his older brother and that he felt he heard his brother in his head during the murders. When we hear that someone is hearing voices, Often the first thing we think of is schizophrenia, but that is not a diagnosis anyone has ascribed to him. Rather, it is suggested that he is using voices in a non-literal literal sense, of influence perhaps, or echoes of his own trauma. We also know that he disavowed these statements later, but that was a bit of a trend with him, to recant his own statements and confessions. Norman was a well-liked teacher, He kept little notes of appreciation from his students, and many spoke of him in glowing terms. But we also know that he pushed and even crossed many boundaries with kids. So as Candace Kemp told us in the last episode, it was well known that he liked to use pinching as a form of corporal punishment. I've also read that he not only declined to participate in stranger danger awareness stuff that the school was doing at the height of the strangler fear, but that he was actively frustrating those efforts by playing practical jokes, it would seem, on his classes, on neighbouring classes, knocking on the doors and saying, be careful, it's the strangler. Norman Simons is also named in the press as Norman Afsal Simons. That is because he briefly converted to Islam in the early 90s and adopted the name Afsal. At the time of his arrest, however, he did consider himself a Christian. Despite this, one of the ways he went about disassociating himself from his crimes in his confessions is to talk about what Afsal did and what Norman did, what he likes about Afsal and what he doesn't like about Norman. Again, I want to emphasize that I'm not suggesting that he had two personalities in the disassociative identity disorder sense, but that it is evident to me, and I think anyone paying vague attention, that he does struggle with integration of some kind. Arguably the most important evidence against Norman Simons is the witnesses who place him with Elroy on the day of his abduction. Remember, it's only Elroy's case that he is ultimately convicted for. There are two of these witnesses. The first is Elroy's cousin Reno, who was with him and initially assisted carrying the boxes in the direction of the train. He is a young and scared boy, probably traumatized by the loss of his cousin and his own proximity to this case. But he did spend at least a few minutes in direct contact with the person in question, and despite this, he was unable to pick Norman out of a lineup. The second witness is the woman at the shopping center who saw the boys interacting with a man. She goes on to be the state star witness, and she is the recipient of the reward money that we've spoken about. She arguably had a lot less of a good look at him than Reno did, 
but she identified Norman from the lineup after some hesitation. Next, we have to deal with the confessions. As I have mentioned before, Norman made a number of these, and he retracted all of them. And there is certainly reason to believe that his mental health was in the toilet at the time of these written confessions. Just on a purely linguistic analysis in the ones I've seen, he shows only a glimpse of the intelligent and articulate person that literally everyone who knew him says he, that he was. His narrative is meandering, and he switches languages and topics often. He writes more about his own life than the actual confession part, what he admits to doing, and is both short and vague and full of formulaic language when he talks about the things that he's actually accused of. Listen to the shift in this sentence. My life was in pieces, fucked, so to say. That's why, in 1986, the brutal killing started. The first part is colloquial and in the first person. The second is formal and uses passive voice. You see this again and again when he says, After the death of my brother in 1991, many killings occurred. He also peppers the confession with flattery of the cops, which could be a narcissistic manipulation tactic at work, or it could just simply be a clumsy bit of work on the part of the cops telling him what to say, and maybe trying to advocate for themselves at the same time. There is a lot, to my mind, that suggests that he is a narcissist. In his own words, he talks about, quote, always needing to feature prominently in a group of people, and another quote, using them, he means his girlfriends, as a disguise, which brings up the issue of who is the real Norman, a classic narcissistic trait. The last three pages of his confession are also, in my opinion, about reputation and perception management. He writes all these little notes to his girlfriend, apologizing for not being honest, to his friends saying, you know, thank you so much for sticking with me, to his past pupils, I mean, that's ballsy, telling them that they are, quote, can-do people. He thanks his colleagues for their support, and he asks forgiveness from South Africa. But forgiveness for what? He doesn't say, I killed those kids. He talks about the killings happening and occurring and general allusions to gruesome events and the loss that people experienced, and that's textbook distancing. A lot of these sentences include signals that he is about to confess, but then he doesn't. Consider this one from page 8. Quote, At the end, though I must confess that it is hard and gruesome to even think about what has happened. The bereaved families. I know it is hard and a loss was caused. End quote. I mean, forgetting for a second that those aren't full sentences... He signals in his writing that he's about to tell you something important and then doesn't. He also sounds quite sorry for himself, if you ask me. He starts the document describing it as a very emotional, practical and heartbreaking report. Those are his words. He also says it contains valuable information about the important parts of my life. There's no sign of victims in either of those words. Later he writes, It is very hard to be possessed but unknown forces that cannot be explained by medication. I mean, I'm sure it is, but that's an odd addition to add to your pouring your soul out in confession of what you've done, isn't it? He signs this thing, I salute you with love for a better understanding and peaceful South Africa. That's all. So yes, he is not in a well way when he writes this, but it also doesn't ring of authenticity, empathy, regret, or guilt. In so many ways, I think the confessions are considerable evidence against him, not ones that I would say are smoking gun evidence. It is definitely from a sort of softer science to say that the linguistics point towards X, Y, and Z. But having read them several times, I am struck by what I would say are key signs of emotional disturbance and narcissism and disassociation from these actions. But there is also a lot of evidence that points elsewhere. And this is what is so critical for people like Natasha Joseph, who I chatted to in that Patreon episode, and why a lot of people say they just don't know. Did he do it? Is he the sole person involved? They just don't know. So let's start with the identikits. 
the various descriptions given by witnesses vary hugely. There's this great quote from an old Argus article from December 2009, so I'm just going to read it to you. Quote, He had long hair, he had short hair. He was tall and slight. He was short and muscular. He had a round face, he had a long face. He was light-skinned, he was dark-skinned. He had missing teeth, he had no missing teeth. He was a lone presence, as insubstantial as a shadow. He was five men on a murderous rampage. The station strangler had as many shapes as fear itself. End quote. Okay, that last little bit is, is totally hokey, but who am I to judge? I just made it to be or not to be joke. The point is not that there was a range of descriptions, but that the descriptions themselves are mutually exclusive. You can't be both tall and short. Having said that, we know that eyewitnesses are simply not the godsend and gospel truth that a prosecution lawyer might want them to be. I'm 5'3", so what I think is tall is probably not what you think is tall. And then there's the other issue, which is how do you describe what you see in your mind's eye to someone with a pencil in their hand? I don't think I could describe my best friend well enough to get a total stranger with a pencil to draw them without having sight of them. I can give you a pretty good approximation of that person, but think of the taxi driver from this morning, or the last person who served you coffee. Were their eyes almond-shaped? So how do we interpret the eyewitness information? We treat it as the approximation that it is. It can inform investigation. It might hold up in court, but I wouldn't want to hang an entire trial on it. And this remains a hurdle for me, I will share the various identity kits I've seen on social media so that you can see what I mean and let me know what you think. And here's an absolutely un unsubstantiated side theory for you. It's not a direct take on the issue of identity kits and eyewitnesses, but something I noticed while doing the research. In 1986, South Africa had just four public TV channels and one of them that year ran a documentary on Wayne Williams. If you don't immediately recognize that name, you probably know Wayne better as the Atlanta Monster. Wayne Williams is an American man who was convicted for the murder of two men in Atlanta, Georgia in 1981. The police believe he was responsible for killing some 24 men and boys between 1979 and 1981. And Wayne is a relatively light-skinned African-American man who had, at the time had a two-inch afro and broad glasses that look a lot like the glasses seen in the Station Strangler identikit. I'm not suggesting that anyone was lying, that anyone saw the Wayne Williams documentary and thought, ha ha, I will make this sound like him. But I also don't think it's ludicrous to suggest that the media salience of that documentary might have muddied recollections in what is already kind of a slippery memory test. Is that definitive? No, of course not. The hair and the glasses are pretty common trends. I read an inaugural professorial lecture given by a staff member from the psychology department at the University of Cape Town, uh, Prof Trudeau. He makes a reference to this case within the context of a broader presentation called Pragmatic Psychology and the Perils of Eyewitness Identification. In this, he warns against, quote, treating recollections from memory as fact, end quote. Next, let's talk about modus operandi, or MO. There are many overlaps in the MO that we can see in the majority of the victims attributed to the strangler. Specifically, many of the boys were lured away from public spaces with the offer of money or food. Most of the victims were sodomized and strangled, usually with a piece of their own clothing. Most were found face down, their hands still tied. There are significant exceptions, or at least variations. There were notes found with two bodies and a crossword in one case. The handwriting could not be tied back to Norman Simons. Jeremy Smith was found with his ear severed, and this is as far as we know the only instance of that. Neville Samai's trousers were cut with scissors, and that's the only instance of that. The boys playing with Alino Sprinkle when he was taken talk about being approached by five men who forcibly abducted Alino. Now that's completely different. Then there's the issue of the car. Norman drove a Mazda. This was never connected to any of the abductions, such as that of Samuel Kaba, who got into an olive green Chrysler Valiant. 
Or in the case of where Elino Sprinkle was discovered, a suspicious Volkswagen Jetta was never connected back to Norman. And I know that in this post-CSI Las Vegas world, we are probably overly reliant on needing forensics to be certain about something. But there are a lot of forensics that point elsewhere here, and that is a problem. A fingerprint found at the disposal site for one of the John Doe's, the one found with the infamous Many More in Store note, did not match Norman Simons. And as I've said, the handwriting couldn't be matched either. I say couldn't be, rather than wasn't a match, because the note was a bit of a scrawl in capital letters. I suspect it would be hard to match it to anyone's normal handwriting. A fingerprint found at the scene where Neville Samai's body was found was also not a match. And we do have blood and semen found at at least two sites. Both were found at the Jeremy Smith site. They did not match Norman. And blood and semen found near where Calvin Spiro was found was said to come from a secretor. And Norman Simons is one of the roughly 20% of the population who are non-secretors. Also under this column of things that point away is uh, similar killings. Investigator J.D. Kotzer has famously said, if Norman wasn't the guy, why did the killings stop after his arrest? But the truth is that they didn't. There are so many cases in and near Cape Town, as well as a few further afield, that have very, very similar MOs. In Joburg, for example, police searched for a man using the same MO of asking kids to help carrying boxes. Of course, this could simply be a copycat, but it's just not accurate to say that the MO stopped when Norman Simons went to jail. It's sadly just not an uncommon MO for a sexual sadist type killer. And there are many other cases that share lots of similarities. In fact, there are many people who believe that their vanished child was a station strangler victim, such as the family of Baden Keat, who vanished from Lendgeer when he was 12. And Reginald Hislop similarly believes that his son, Jason, was a victim of the Strangler. This, we think, is the man that Tash describes hearing in her recollections from the inquest in 2005. And then finally, where is Norman Simons today? He is serving out his sentence at the Drakenstein Maximum Security Correctional Centre in Paul, which is sort of northeast inland from Cape Town. He became eligible for parole in 2015 and apparently applied for it in 2016, but was denied. It is very unlikely that he will ever receive parole, not least of all because he still maintains his innocence. He has reportedly continued to teach in prison, training fellow prisoners in math, tourism, languages and more. He is 54 this year. So I guess the only thing left to say is what do I think? And the short answer is I don't know. I strongly, strongly suspect that he was responsible for at least some of the disappearances, rapes and murders. I am tempted to at least ask if he participated as part of a duo of killers, which we do see fairly commonly. And it's also worth considering if he was himself a copycat. He was literally just out of school when the first killing started. As I've maintained throughout these episodes, I am not trying to exonerate this man at all. But I think that the idea that this is case closed, that we have it all wrapped up in a beautiful little bow, is just not something that we can justify. Right, so that was your little mini extra episode as promised. I have all of the sources in the show notes. And I'm busy prepping the next case for you, so that will land in just a couple of days. Until then, stay well and see you on the socials, I guess.